Did you just say that you were a Muslim inside? Yeah, I went, to, so I studied religion, all religions, a lot, and for a long time. Yeah, we're going to talk about this. Yeah, so then I started with, so I got hooked up with the Muslims when I was in the Don jail with a guy named uh, Richard Anderson, because he hung with Malcolm X in jail. This okay. is the era I'm talking about. So he, so he said, listen, man, you should become a Muslim, Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad stuff. And how uh, old are you at this point? Just 16, just turned 17. Mm. Yeah, so I went into the, I went from the Don jail to the pen as a Muslim. Mm. So that's when I first, and you first, in those days when you first went in, they had a little red card and they, the guy typing up would say, where are you from, Toronto? What's your beef? Whatever, robbery, whatever you want to say. How much time you doing? Blah, blah, blah. What's your religion? Blah, blah, blah. So I said life, and I wasn't, and Muslim, because I was. And then a friend of mine come, what are you, crazy? I see the card on your door. What are you, what are you nuts? You say you're a life, you're not a life, or people just too stupid to get away with murder our lifers. We're hoods, man. We're... So I had to get my card changed. But I got the first pork free diet and all that kind of stuff in Collins Bay and in Quebec. In Quebec, I had to go to the hole for a long time fighting because I pushed the cart of food over. And it was, uh, where's my diet? Ah, we don't care. Uh, we, this is a, this is a Catholic a society of uh, fighting for Muslim rights. <laughs> so, so off to the hole I go. So while I was in the hole, the warden come, he said, listen, you're a big tough guy and we got your reports from Ontario. <coughs> Would you be satisfied with a, a Jewish diet? And I said, yeah, that works. Yeah. So. Yeah. That makes sense. You said uh, you spent a lot of time studying <coughs> different religions. Yeah, I went, not only did I study them in jail, but I also mm -hmm. went and did uh, correspondence courses in various universities, Queens, Western University, mm. uh, outside of London. And there's a reason why. Okay. Because I'm a criminal and I have a big ego. And I said to myself, if I become a master of religions, I can start a cult, be a cult leader, and have thousands of people following me. Mm, I like around, that. Flying around in jet planes. So I didn't play with it. I went and studied it. I studied yes. cults. I studied it. And then at the end of it, it's like, ah, I don't think I want to rule people in that manner. You know what I mean? Mm. So, but I at least did the study of it. So I did the Salvation Army course in Don Jill. The guy said I finished it faster and got the best marks of anyone he ever knew because I was in it. I wanted cult leader yeah yeah man never mind about this gang stuff never mind about the stuff on the street Rah, we could take over the whole nation Rah. Hmm. I, I, I don't know i, I kind of feel like you were you might have been onto something <laughs> you know that you, you maybe you should have gone down that path that's it i heard there's wealth down there there is, but the thing is, it's really deceptive to play that game. And we know people in, that have been playing that game. We've seen them through history play that game. Uh, religious people that have fallen, we'll say. We've seen that. Yes. But uh, there's people that have fallen that have now, after 20 years, have picked themselves up and a new flock has come in. Oh, of course. And they're paying the bills and doing the stuff. So that's hustling also. That's pimping. That's pimping. It's what it is. Not to say that all religious leaders... Or that, yeah. but it's the, the, from a street perspective, that's what it is, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and and I think that for many people, there's a genuine need that's met through uh, the, the practice, the, majority, yeah. the practice the of majority. religion. Uh -huh. um, nonetheless, or let me put it to you like this: as a as a counterpoint to what you're saying, devil's advocate. Don't you think that even if it's a Kind of a con. Maybe it's still acceptable because you're helping people meet Even genuine if the needs. The preacher's not that good because he just started. <clears throat> he may reach somebody that changes their life for the rest of their life. So right. Even a poor preacher can help. But even a fake preacher could help. Yeah, so he can't help. He's hurting more than he helps, though. So some people he's going to help, but his intent is to hurt. Jim Jones is a good example. Hmm. Nine hundred people died. Jim Jones, 900 people of his congregation are dead. The same as that is Koresh. I think that's hard to quantify in our minds, like 900 people. I think that's hard for the average person to quantify. Yeah, that. are dead because they believed his philosophy. Yeah. And and his his psychology or his psychopathy, because he's a psychopath. He ordered 900 people murdered because he didn't get along with the government. Hmm. And then Koresh, you look at him. The, yes. That one, the, so Koresh, Koresh, his family and his children and his followers, they died because 
he didn't agree with a, a government policy over gun possession. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it helps. So, Elijah Muhammad come out of jail, started the Nation of Islam. Mm-hmm. And one million people, then maybe all together, five million people over time, over the last 50 years, joined the Nation of Islam. What I would say with 95% of them doing well. Yes. Within the umbrella of that religion and what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to treat your neighbors and your fellow Muslims, right? Mm-hmm. So that was a good thing, even though Elijah Muhammad fell from grace. His son took over, Herbert Muhammad, who was Elijah Ma- or Muhammad Ali's boxing manager. And then Louis Farrakhan took over after that. Louis Farrakhan now over the last 30 years, 35 years, have been running the show. And you could say he still maintained that power structure. Yes. And for those millions of people in it are doing good. They're not committing crime because he doesn't advertise that. Uh, they're not insulting their neighbors. Mm-hmm. He doesn't advertise that. Right? They're paying homage to God teaching and learning he he advocates that mm-hmm. so yeah for millions of people it, it's good so you could say that the uh, the nation of islam is a cult and it is in the greater aspects of islam and and, and so you can go places in the world if you because i said once to a muslim guy all praise due to elijah muhammad the last messenger of allah and he <laughs> lost his friggin mind on me well wow. i thought he's going to start kung fu me all over the place right yeah, because I, I had said that he was shocked that I had said that. What are you talking about? Yeah, and I mentioned this, and he goes, "Man, it's a cult. It's a cult. Get out of there. Get out of that." To him, that's blasphemy. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. So, 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 so you'd go as far as calling as put classifying the nation of Islam as a cult? Not now. Not no. Okay, but because back then. Uh, when Herbert Muhammad, when Elijah, Elijah Muhammad died off, Herbert Muhammad opened the nation of Islam. They didn't allow white people into their religion yes that made it a cult mm. even though they're under the auspice of islam and using the quran as their methodology of teaching mm-hmm. by just not allowing white people in who are muslims also makes it a cult and a racist cult to boot yeah so i then, understand what yeah, you mean so then when herbert muhammad changed that it's still racially orientated herbert muhammad or not herbert muhammad uh, 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 Louis Farrakhan still has that about him. Yeah. He still has that racial divide. He's ready to play it at any time and discuss it. So he still has that as the foundation of, of, of his preaching. Yes. It's still a better place than it was in terms of, of global Islam. Yes, yes. But there's, there's many cults in Islam, just like, or many cults, there's many divisions of Islam, just like Christianity. There's many divisions of Christianity. Yes, yes, yes. So. And I think that, um, yeah, fundamentally what Farrakhan does. It's funny because there's good and bad in everything, right? Because on one hand, you can look at it. Farrakhan, that's Elijah Muhammad, was most of his converts came out of prison. Mm -hmm. And I think the Nation of Islam, uh, Louis Farrakhan's group, I think they do well in prison for guys. Yes, yes. Really help guys out, help transition, help navigate, as Elijah Muhammad did, as Malcolm X did. Yes. Right? Not so much as Black Panther leaders, UEP Newton, Bobby Seale. They weren't, the, the, the stuff they were telling guys in prison was murder and revolt. Yeah. Right? And Elijah Muhammad's not, and you know, Herbert Muhammad, and now uh, Louis Farrakhan are saying, just comport yourself as a true Muslim would. Nobly. Exactly. And yeah. Do what you're supposed to do and realize that you're not in charge, but they're not in charge of your religion either mm. because you have these rights and we'll help you instill those rights. Yeah. yeah so it's more about teaching you how to live peaceably, practically speaking. To live with a group. Buddhism is the same way. So the three jewels of Buddhism is what you're learning. Uh, at, at admiration for the Buddha. They, Buddha doesn't say worship. Admiration for the Buddhism. And who you're living with, what you're learning, and who you're living with, mm. right? So we, I was in an all-black halfway house, the only one ever in Canada. Okay. And it lasted for nine months. And the guy, back to Rosie Douglas, the guy that negotiated a contract for the black halfway house stole the money, took off to Dominica, gave it to Rosie Douglas, which is a communist party, and Canada freaked out. The first experiment for helping brothers get out of jail for a black halfway house turn into giving this communist leader this money. That's a bad look. So they haven't had a black halfway house since. I bring it up all the time because I know it's it's the key to success in our black communities. 
Oh. It's 100% the key to success. You think that will make a difference? 100% it makes a difference. It works this way. So in the native community, they have this thing called gladu, the law. So what gladu was is took the power of the white man's court away and gave it back to the native community. It's called the gladu project. So the native community had an input of what the judge was going to do. And it was over a guy that got sentenced to five years for a beanie breaking into a cottage. And the community thought that that was just too much. So they challenged the court system and they ended up sentencing him to two weeks on an island by himself with counseling and mentoring rather than do five years in a white man's jail. Mm -hmm. That started this thing within Corrections Canada to help natives navigate their, their time and get out safer for society, safer for them. So they started a halfway house for natives. And now they've got halfway houses right across the Canada for natives. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a native program, and a brother can get involved in the native program when he's in jail. If you okay. can do the native program, you get out to the native halfway house. It's a community thing. The community kind of embraces you. It's not pushing you away. They pull you into their community. Their community is different than, we'll say, a black community because the religion's different. They have mm -hmm. a singular entity, and that's the great spirit, mm -hmm. which you can't really identify. It's just a great spirit. When we have Jehovah, Allah, we have these other things. Yeah. things. So we all have to get along under those umbrellas. They don't because they have this one spirituality, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a called animistic religion, an earthbound spirit uh, religion. Yes. So the, your, your mother earth is what truly you're worshiping and the great spirit that created it, right? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, to what extent do you think, just to dig a, deep, a bit deeper on that, to what extent do you think the... The black half whales. Uh, I'm going to go back to that. Okay. But before we get to that, to what extent do you think uh, having a, a unified religion is important for any culture to flourish? Like I don't think it's that important. You don't think I it's that a, important? I had a friend named... Uh, Raddy Kamel, he wrote a book called Invisible, and the best book I ever read. He's a political, political, political science PhD guy doing time for killing his wife, life mm -hmm. 25 he got. And for those whole 25 years, he hung with our crew of guys inside. Really smart guy, and he wrote a book about it wouldn't work a singular religion. What would work is the same thing the Pantheon that Rome had. Mm -hmm. Rome didn't, when they Rome conquered your country, i.e. Egypt, mm -hmm. they didn't take the Egyptian religion from them. They just, they just incorporate it into their thing. It's a pantheon of religions. Yeah. Yep. So, and that worked for the Roman Empire. Mm. And uh, Raddy's intellect and what he wrote, and what I believe now too, that can work for the whole world. We all don't have to be of one religion. We have to just respect the other guy's religion. Yeah. Like we do in prison. Yeah. But specifically, though, as it relates to like subcultures, let's say, quote unquote, black people, right? Do you think that black people's development might be hindered because of the, the multiplicity of religions that are found among them? One person maybe can't deal with this guy because he believes in this God well, and you believe I, in this God. If you believe in tribalism and isolationism of a single tribe, mm -hmm. makes sense what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Our tribe should think one way. But if you look at it as black people, traveling the entire world and globalizing the planet, then no. Yes. Because the millions of us around the world don't agree on the same religious leader. The key to it is not us hating the other guy for agreeing what he's uh, uh, adhering to. Mm. That's the key. And in Raddy's book, that's what he talked about. He talked about us as a, a global entity getting along religiously because we don't impose ourselves on your religion by violence mm. or political intrigue. You just do your thing. If you get more converts, there's 8 billion people in the world. There's three major religions, Islam, Buddhism, and Christianity. Mm -hmm. There, In each religion, there's a billion followers. Mm. That's 3 billion people against another 5 billion people who don't believe your stuff. Mm. Yet we still get along in that globalized sense. The three religions are still there. They're prophesizing religions, which means they knock on your door and ask you to become part of their religion. Mm -hmm. But the other five billion people in the world don't knock on your door, don't bother you about your religion, don't ask about what you're into. Mm. If you say, I'm a Muslim, they go, great. What are you? I'm an earthbound spirit. I don't have a religion. Yes. You just go on living amongst each other. It's only when your religion comes so ego-based to you as a religious leader that you say, we only want non-Muslims in this institution, and you then try to make that happen, and you're only 1% of the population. 
and you're trying to get the other 90% of the population to believe what you want to believe, i.e., is there any pork sold, served in a Canadian federal prison? No. Why? Because guys like me push that issue. Hmm. And now the whole institution doesn't have pork. And I'm sure there's guys in jail who aren't Muslims wouldn't mind biting into a pork chop now and then because that's what they're used to. But because of us and our, our willingness to use violence to get our point across, cause the administration to say, listen, we don't need these maniacs because that's what they used to call us with their religious fever destroying our institution. We'll just take pork out. Mm. Right. And pork now is not sold or not sold or not, is not served in Canadian federal prisons unless you have a trailer visit and you order your menu, you could order what you want for you, your wife, your kids to eat in there. So you can be in a, a, a institution, we'll say is 60% Muslim. There are none, but we'll say that if you had a trailer visit, you still can eat pork. Right. Because that's your right under the Canadian law. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I don't believe any religion should impose themselves upon another. Mm -hmm. for gain to their religion, but every religion, every prophesizing religion does that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So just the way the world, it's been going on for 2,000, 2,500 years now, 2,300 years now with the uh, uh, the temple, King David. Temple. Yes. That's when it started. That's, so that's how far we go back to that. So, 